Well, good morning, Bayshore and Millsboro. Good to see you guys. So glad you're here. How many glad to be in church this morning? Glad to be in church? Great to see you. What a great time we had with uh, worship. Amazing worship. Absolutely off the charts today. And so glad you were here for that. So good to see you. And uh, I wanted to give a big shout out to our Millsboro Care Team. We have a ministry at Millsboro and Fenwick Island called uh, the Care Team. And these folks care for people. They send cards to encourage people. They take food to people that uh, need food and uh, incredible things. So just a little bit what they've done in the last uh, recent uh, days here. By the way, there's 37 members of the Care Team at this campus and uh, sent roughly 150 cards. Uh, recently f- to birthdays, get well, thinking of you. Um, 22 meals have been provided for four families just in recent months or the last month or so. Uh, sent encouraging emails, made phone calls, made a couple hospital visits and many more. The Millsboro Care Team has blue, little blue uh, uh, tags on and this team is led by Judy Dowdy and also Judy Dowdy and Lisa Malin- Malinsky. And uh, if you're part of the care team, would you stand up? If you're in this service, just stand up if you're part of the care team. And I want you guys to give these big guys a shout. Thank you guys for all you do. Incredible. Thank you for your ministry. And uh, just so cool to see how they encourage people, you know, and uh, just great. So, hey, listen, we're in a series. In fact, we're finishing up our series today called Dual Connection. And... Uh, By the way, I'm Pastor Dan, if you're new here, so glad that you're here with us. Uh, We are in um, this, finishing up this series, and Dual Connection has been a series on the book of 1 John, trying to understand what this book is about. One of the big things we do here at Bayshore is teach the Bible publicly so you can read it privately, so you can really grow in your faith. We really believe in people growing in their faith by reading the Bible themselves, and so we're so glad that you are uh, leaning into that. So today we're going to finish the series... And we're going to get, uh, there's lots more we could cover, lots more we could talk about. Um, next week, we're starting a new series called uh, Jesus Before Christmas. And that is the, all the Christmas prophecies in the Old Testament, how we know Christmas was coming. So Jesus be, or Christmas Before Jesus. So well, that's going to start next week. And uh, we're, we're going to be running that through uh, up to Christmas. So it's going to be a great series. But today, we want to look at 1 John 5, uh, 13 through 15. Uh, And this is the last chapter of the book. And John writes this amazing thing as he says in 1 John 5, 13 through 15. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. This is the confidence that we have in approaching God that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And we know that he hears us If he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have received what we've asked of him. One more time. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. This is the confidence that we have in approaching God that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have received from him what we asked of him. So one of the big issues in the book of 1 John, a little little book, uh, five chapters, one of the big issues is the idea of assurance. These folks are really not sure of their salvation. They're struggling with maybe they don't have this right. And the reason that that's taken place is because there's been this kind of like uh, exodus from the church of these false teachers that said basically that if you uh, are going to really be a Christian, you have to have this special esoteric knowledge from God, that God will give you this special revelation. And there was a group of people that kind of pulled away from this little spiritual community that John was writing to, and they had this belief that in order to really be a part of God's kingdom and to be saved, you had to receive this very secret revelation And uh, later on, there was this movement called Gnosticism that happened like a little bit after the New Testament. This is the beginning of that idea, that people are saying, you know, what we really need is some special form of revelation so that we'll know this secret knowledge that other people don't know. And if we have this secret knowledge, and only a few people have it, 
then we're really saved. And these false teachers had, had protested that they had this secret knowledge and every, everybody else didn't have that secret knowledge. And uh, it's sort of a really big problem for these people because they're thinking, well, maybe these people are right. Maybe they are right. Maybe, maybe we don't have it right. Maybe we really don't have salvation. Maybe what John and the other apostles said to us, that if you believe in Jesus and put your faith in Jesus, that Jesus died on the cross for you, and that he took all your sins on his, on his person as he was on the cross receiving the judgment of God, and then he was raised from the dead to verify that your sins were forgiven. Maybe that's not right. Maybe we do have to have this secret, special knowledge that only a few people had. Now, if you remember, like when you were in high school, you remember high school when you had your locker, your own locker? Do you remember your locker? You had a locker in high school. My locker was on the first floor of uh, Seaford Senior High School there in Seaford, and it was just down the hallway from Mrs. Causeway. My homeroom teacher, who always sent me to the principal's office every morning because I was late again and get my tardy slip. And I remember going down to my locker, and I got a, a lock in ninth grade. And remember, you'd come up to your locker, and you would lean against your locker, and you'd hold that lock in your hands. And how many remember doing the combination with your thumb? Do you remember that? And you just like, you went right and went left and then a little short back to the right and then you yanked on it and your lock came open that is a cool experience and you think about that you're a locker and you're the only one in the school that knows the combination to your locker and you alone have that secret knowledge the only other person happens is your girlfriend and your girlfriend, she can come up to your locker and she can lean against it and open your lock and get into your locker, put her books in there with your books. Remember that? And that all works good until you break up with your girlfriend. Then you got your girlfriend who has your locking combination. That's a big problem. <laughs> so these false teachers, they had the combination, the salvation. They had the combination of how to be in the kingdom of God. And they had this esoteric, secret knowledge that nobody else had, and they had it. And so when you read the book of 1 John, you're reading about, you know, 15 times in the book the word know is used because people aren't sure if they know for sure that they have salvation because maybe they're wrong. And so John writes to them to encourage them. When you think about that secret knowledge thing, that makes like 1 John 2.20 make a lot of sense. When he says in 1 John 2.20, but you have an anointing from the Holy One and all of you know the truth. Why is he saying that all of you know the truth? He's saying that to these people that are, maybe we got it wrong. Maybe we don't have the secret knowledge. And John writes and says, all of you know the truth. You've heard about Jesus. You've heard that Jesus has died on the cross for you, that he is the Son of God, and you do have salvation. And so he's trying to assure them it's possible to have salvation and be in right relationship with God and have doubts. Sometimes people, like, they look at their life, and I've told you many times about Karen, how she went to this Methodist church. My wife Karen, she would be insecure about her salvation, went to the altar every Sunday, and the pastor said, I think you got it now. And, you know, God does not want us to live in insecurity. He wants us to have assurance of our salvation. And so that's the thing that they were struggling with. And when John writes in 1 John 2.20, but you have the anointing of the Holy One, the Holy Spirit's on you, he's saying, and all of you know the truth. And I do not write to you because you do not know the truth, but because you do know it and because no uh, lie comes from the truth. So that's, it makes sense. You know, the context helps you to understand the text in the Bible. Context helps you to understand the text. And so the deal was that they were feeling like, you know, maybe, maybe we're not right. Maybe we don't have it. Maybe we're not really Christians. Maybe these, these false teachers, maybe they got it right. And John says, no, you got it right. You heard about Jesus. Because listen to this, Christianity, and they were, they, these false teachers were saying, you needed to have special 
secret information called gnosis or Gnosticism, which is what the movement became. You need to have secret information. You know, Gnosis. This week, maybe you're at a party. You can say, you know, I've been thinking about Gnosis a lot lately. What do you think about Gnosis? You know, they're not going to know what you're talking about. They're going to be impressed with you, though. <laughs> secret information. Listen to this. Christianity is not about what you know. It's about who you know. Christianity is not about what you know. Christianity is about who you know. There's a lot of religions in this world that say if you have the right understanding, the right philosophy, if you have the right kind of like understanding of some deep philosophical understanding, then you will be, you know, a part of this grand spirit of the universe. But Christianity is not about what you know. It's about who you know. A couple years ago, uh, Karen and I met our family, grandkids at uh, Shellville at Christmas time. I don't know if you've ever been to Shellville behind the Alice. How many have ever been to Shellville at Christmas time? You got, I mean, I tell you, this is just wonderful. They're going to have it this year again. There's ice rings in there and there's little displays. And, and uh, so we were going to meet our, our, our kids, our, our sons and their wives and our grandkids. And it was a couple weeks before Christmas and it was one of those cold December nights. And we're going to get to go to Shellville. And so we park and we arrange how we're going to meet. And, and we start walking up there. And my son, Tim, at that time worked for Shell Brothers. He was, he was Chris Shell's kind of like personal assistant. Shell Brothers is owned by, you know, two brothers. Uh, and Chris Shell was one of the brothers. And my son, Tim, very close to him, worked in that organization, very high up in the organization. And, uh, and so Tim had passes. He had free passes for us to just walk right in the front gate. And uh, we're coming up there, and there is a line in the cold. Must have been a half mile long of people waiting in line to get into Shellville. And I walked, you know, with my, my pass, and Tim had his pass, Karen had her pass, Nora and Nixon had their pass, Jack and Willow had their pass. We just walked right in the front gates, and like these people were freezing, been in the cold. And there I felt so bad because a couple people back in the, right in the front of the line was Corey Phoebus and his wife Heather, <laughs> who lead one of our worship leaders. And their kids were there with them, and their kids had frostbite, and they were cold. <laughs> And I felt so bad for Corey, and I thought for a moment, why don't I give him my pass and let them get in? But I didn't feel that bad. So uh, <laughs> we went right in. It's who you know. You know, it's knowing Jesus, having a relationship with Jesus. If you're here today and you think it's about religion, it's about checking off the boxes, that is so wrong. Because it's about knowing Jesus, the, the maker of the universe, the eternal Son of God, who has always existed, whose light and glory, and who's pure without any sin, who came to this earth and put on human flesh and was tempted in every way, just as you and I are, yet without sin. And he became our substitute on the cross. And we put our faith in him. doesn't mean we just believe in Jesus. It means the word pastuo, put our faith in him. We rely on him. You're the only way we're ever going to be in right relationship with our, our Father, with God. And so that was the message that the people of 1 John heard, that little spiritual community. That's the message they heard from the apostles. But then these people came along and said, hey, you got, got that right. It's not that easy. It's not that easy. Yes, it is that easy. It is easy to come to the faith. It's easy to come to Jesus. You have to repent of your sins. You have to give your life to him, but it's easy to be forgiven. I want you to know that the, uh, your biggest problem and my biggest problem has already been taken care of. You know, I've got, how many, I don't want to ask you to raise your hand, but how many got some problems? You got some stuff in your life right now. Some of you can't, you know, you got, we got problems. You got, some of you got health problems. I got plantar fasciitis in this left uh, leg. I've had it for like my, my foot. I probably had it for like six weeks now. And uh, boy, you know, I called, I have a knee doctor, uh, Dr. Kane. I love Dr. Kane at BB and 
you know, he did on my knees. I called him. I said, how far down on the leg do you go? Do you go all the way down to the bottom? He said, no, you got to see a podiatrist. And so I saw a podiatrist. And I explained to him what's going on. He said, yep, you got plantar fasciitis. Good luck with that, you know? <laughs> I like, like there's nothing else. He just, you know, ride it out, man. That's my problem. I got that problem. It's not my only problem. I got other problems. All of us have got problems. We got problems. Some of us have got problems at work. Some of us have got problems with, with uh, you know, uh, things with our family. You got family issues. You got people in your family that are difficult to get along with and all that. And, you know, Thanksgiving's coming up and you're already starting to use drugs thinking about coming to that family dinner. <laughs> you know, sometimes you just like all that stuff happens in our life. We all have problems. But our biggest problem has already been solved. It says in the Gospels that Jesus came back to Capernaum. And he came to Capernaum because that was his home, uh, his home base. And he came back to Capernaum and, and uh, people were so excited to see him. Jesus was raised in Nazareth, but he, his headquarters and ministry was in Capernaum at the northern end of the, of the Sea of Galilee. I've been to Capernaum, beautiful little, little town right on the Sea of Galilee. You can walk down to the beach and you can see the Sea of Galilee. The sea of Galilee is only 13 miles long and you can look down that, that sea. And they have, they've excavated what they think is the Apostle Peter's house in Capernaum. And across the street is the synagogue. There's a synagogue across the street that's, you know, a couple layers of synagogues. Probably the very synagogue that Jesus visited was, is in there right on that street. But the Bible says in the Gospels that Jesus came back to Capernaum and people were so excited to see him that they filled this house up. They filled this house up with people and, and they were so excited to see Jesus and people from Jerusalem came because they were trying to catch Jesus in some type of uh, infraction and they came and the teachers of the law were there and the place is full and Jesus is teaching. He's teaching the word. And I, I just imagine that Jesus was so riveting when he taught the Bible, when he taught about the Old Testament, about the kingdom of God. I think it was funny. You know, he said things like, you know, if you got your brother has a speck in their eye, you know, if you've got a log in your eye, don't try to take the speck out of the eye. You're like knocking people over with a log in your eye. That's funny. He was engaging. But while he was teaching, there was uh, four guys that brought their friend because their friend was paralyzed. And as they're looking at their uh, situation, the house is full, there's no way in. They didn't give up. The Bible says they climbed up on the roof and Jesus is inside teaching. And they begin to tear the roof apart. And debris is falling down on people. And they're wiping the dust off their head. And they let down this man right in front of Jesus as he's teaching. And they're like, the Pharisees are thinking, that's ah, Sabbath, what's he going to do here? And Jesus looked at that man and Jesus said, son, don't you love that? Tenderness out of the mouth of Jesus, son. Son, your sins are forgiven you. Then everybody freaked out. You know, how can he forgive sins? Nobody can forgive, forgive sins but God alone. And the Bible says that Jesus said, so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. Son, rise up and be healed. And that man walked out and he was healed. His biggest problem was not being paralyzed. His biggest problem is that his sin had separated him from God, that he had fallen short of God's glory. He had really blew it. He had really messed up. He was sinning in darkness. Well, there was a God of light who had created him and created the universe. And Jesus forgave his sins. And because he wanted to convince the crowd that he had authority to forgive sins, he healed that man in front of them. So your biggest problem and my biggest problem, my biggest problem is not my plantar fasciitis. My biggest problem is not any financial issues. My biggest problem is not family issues. My biggest problem was sin, and I was separated from God because of my sin. And I want you to know that my biggest problem has been solved so I can wake up every morning full of joy, full of grace, full of happiness, having assurance that my salvation is secure, not worrying if I'm in right relationship with the Lord. It doesn't matter what happens. It doesn't matter what I go through i am destined to live eternally in the presence of the god of light who loves me and cares for me yeah. 
So I want you to know that your biggest problem has already been solved. And the Bible says that these people in this uh, situation here, they were struggling, you know. They were thinking, oh, my goodness, maybe I'm not, you know. And they lacked assurance, and John writes to them and encouraged them. And then he talks about prayer in this verse. And it's interesting what he says about it. He said, this is the confidence we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Now, why does he write that to these insecure people? Remember, the problem is assurance. They're not, they're not sure of their salvation. And so he says, this is the confidence we have in approaching God. If we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. So he writes that because one of the things that we know is absolutely God's will for everybody there is something that's God's will for everybody. Now, all of us have different paths we follow. Sometimes we, you know, feel like, uh, you know, we pray, are we supposed to go to this school or that school? And God has different paths that we're all taking. But there's one thing that's universally true of all of us, and it's God's will for all of us. And the universal thing that's true of all of us, it's God's will that everybody be saved. It's God's will that everybody have a vibrant relationship with Jesus and that they're born again. The Bible says in 2 Peter, it is God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So here's the idea. The idea is it's absolutely God's will for everybody to be saved. And John writes, we know that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. So why is he writing that in this context? He's writing them to give them assurance because they're saying, you know, I'm, I'm not sure. And then, then he says, he backs them up. He says, do you believe that if you ask anything according to God's will, he hears us? And then everybody has to assent to that. So when he says, if we ask anything according to God's will, he hears us, he's referring to primarily in the beginning that this idea that we have, we know it's God's will that everybody be saved. And if I pray for God to save me, if it's God's will, then I will be saved. So how could I have in assurance, not be assured if it is God's will that I be saved and I pray and ask him in uh, if it for save me. And because it's his will, God always answers prayers that are, called, called, uh, that are uttered in according to his will. Every prayer that's prayed that's in God's will is always answered. It's God's will that everybody be saved. So if I pray, Lord, save me, it's God's will, so it happens. That's the primary meaning of that initial meaning of that text there. So that's what we're, what we're dealing with here. We're dealing with this idea of assurance. And then we get to this idea about prayer in general. This is such a good verse about prayer. And it says... This is the confidence we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. <clears throat> and if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we've asked of him. So here's the thing about prayer. Prayer is not about twisting God's arm to do what I want him to do. This verse emphatically says that the key to prayer is understanding what God's will is. So sometimes we think, you know, if, if I ask God enough times for something, if I say to God over and over and over again, I want you to do this, and if I keep pestering God like a little child at the grocery store that says, I want this toy, I want this toy. We take our grandkids shopping now, and they're like, some, there's a, one of them in particular that like just wants to pester you to death about getting a toy, or getting something. I want this, I want this. Prayer is not like that. It's not like if I ask God a million times that he's going to give me what I ask him because I've asked him so much. That is an illusion. This verse says that prayer is effective when we're praying in God's will, when we understand what God's will is. And, you know, that's a tough thing sometimes. Here's how you pray. When you pray, you come to the Lord. You say, Lord, I always come to God in honesty. Uh, if somebody, you know, that's sick that I want to get, I want them to see get well. I say, Lord, I want this to happen. I just want this person to be made well. I want them to be made well. I'm, that's what I really want. I don't understand your will, though. You see, it was back in the 70s and the 80s in the charismatic movement. We thought that if you ever ask God, Lord, according to your will, that was weakness. That that was weakness. You want to be able to walk to God and say, 
God, here's what I want you to do. It's in your word. I want you to do it right now. Well, that sounds good. But we sometimes presume that we know what God's will is. So we have to say, Lord, give us wisdom about what your will is. Show us what your will is. Help us to understand what your will is. How many here remember remember radios in your car? Do you remember radios in your car? I know I use Spotify now and Pandora a little bit, mainly Spotify. And remember radios? When I was in high school, I had a little VW bug and a little metallic blue bug. And I'm, you know, got the window still. My hair is flowing out the window. And and I'm driving down, I'm listening to music, and I, leave, I, t- I take the radio, and you know how you tune the radio to get it to the right station. You pass it a little bit, it gets a little fuzzy, and then you bring it back. How do you remember that? Some of you are saying, you, young, you know, our millennials and, and Gen Z are saying, well, what's a radio? I mean, they're like, how does that work? But when you have a radio, you're tuning the station to get right where it is, to know where it is. And then all of a sudden you hit that, that sweet spot and it's clear and you can hear the music and John Denver is singing sunshine and it's a wonderful thing. <laughs> Prayer is like, Lord, here's what I want, but I don't know what I'm, I don't know, Lord, what your will is. I don't want to presume that I know what your will is. Your word says in 1 Corinthians 13 that we look through a glass darkly. We prophesy in part and we know in part. It means we don't know everything. And so we ask the Lord to help us. That's why the Lord's Prayer is essential in every part of our Christian life. Every sermon I preach has some connection with the Lord's Prayer. How about what it says in the Lord's Prayer, this part? Our Father which art in heaven, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. When you pray, you're praying for God's kingdom. What is his purpose in this situation? Justin Tucker, he lines up to kick a field goal. He missed one a few weeks ago. I was really surprised. We were all surprised. We were disappointed. We needed that field goal. You see Justin Tucker, he lines up. He lines up his body. He looks at the goal. Steps, first steps, and he's looking at that goal. He's lining up his body to kick that field goal. When you're praying, you start with honesty. Lord, I don't know what you're doing here, but here's what I want. And you line up and try to find God's will. And, and this is particularly true when we're praying for people to, you know, get healed. And God heals people. We have great testimonies. But I remember when we, and Karen and I were young, we were back uh, when we first got married. We were like, knew it all. But the Bible, knew what the Bible said. And Karen's boss's wife got sick with cancer, had a brain tumor. We go to Johns Hopkins University to see um, Sue and and we're in there, and we're claiming the word, and standing on the word, and told Dr. Sloan, she's going to be okay. Well, she, she went to be with the Lord, and, and, and we, we had it all wrong. Did we not pray hard enough? Did we not bang the doors of heaven enough? Did we not fast enough? Did we not do enough to make it happen? Prayer is not about trying to get God to do what you want him to do. Prayer is about understanding what his sovereign purpose is in somebody's life. I told you last week, Karen and I went to see that, uh, that movie on my birthday. I was 66 a couple last week or whatever, and... We went to see the movie, the documentary on my birthday called After Death. After Death. It's a documentary on death. And all these like near-death experiences they did. And they had this incredible research of these people that have crossed over to the other side. One guy had, was dead for 90 minutes, wrote a book called 90 Minutes in Heaven. 23% of the experiences were negative were dark. They were in this dark tunnel. 77% of them were drawn toward this wonderful light. One guy said he loved his grandfather, hadn't seen his grandfather's ear. His grandfather was in that light. His grandfather coming toward him. And his grandfather was in the prime of his life. And they saw relatives. And they felt incredible love. They felt incredible grace. They felt incredible peace. 
And one of the guys, this Piper guy, I think it was Piper, is his name, the guy that wrote 90 Minutes in Heaven, he came back, he came back, and he was depressed for being back. He was sad that he was back. When somebody goes to be with the Lord, we didn't lose, we, weren't the, we didn't mess up, we're the losers because we're still here. Just turn to your neighbor and say, we're the losers. Just say it to them right now. <laughs> Paul said, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. we got to get a bigger perspective about life and the reality of eternity. And as we walk our life, we think all of the happiness is contained in this little space we live in. And I'm here to tell you, I have not seen nor ear heard the things that God has prepared for those that love him. So we start our prayer with honesty. Lord, this is what I want you to do, but I plead ignorance. I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know if I'm praying your will. But I ask you to tune me up so I can see your will. If we ask anything according to his will, he hears us, and we know that we have what we've asked of him because we prayed in his will. That is what the scripture says. And I'm here to tell you that's so liberating. So liberating. Well, say, Pastor Danny, what about like praying, you know, you know, praying like the widow story where she's banging on the door and she's praying, you know, give me bread, give me bread. And, and Jesus talking about persistence. Persistence in prayer is connected to executing in the spirit what God's will is on this planet. We're called to execute in prayer what God's will is on this planet. And so we pray in that way. Uh, Remember Elijah, Elijah in the Old Testament, Elijah, you know, confronted the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel. And, and, uh, and then he said, you know, the Lord had told him that it was going to rain. It was supposed to rain. It hadn't rained for three and a half years. And so after he got rid of all the prophets of Baal and Ahab went back to Jerusalem, and he said, you go back to Jerusalem because it's going to rain. And, and, and this is God's will. But here's how does it get initiated? He goes to uh, the top of Mount Carmel, and he gets on his knees and he puts his face on the ground right in front of his knees. He's in like a birthing position and he's praying for it to rain. He sends his servant, so go check to see if it's, there's any clouds. And the servant runs and the servant looks and says, No cloud, nothing. He prays again and the servant comes back and third time, no cloud. He's praying, he prays, and he prays, and prays the fourth time, the fifth time, sends a servant, no cloud. He's praying persistently, but he's praying, he's executing God's will. And then finally, he prays the seventh time, and he sends the servant, and he says, I see a cloud about the size of a man's hand. And he says, you better get your raincoat on. It's going to rain and he executed God's will by persistence. Say this with me. If we pray, if we pray anything, anything according to God's will, to God's will he, hears he hears us. And we know that we have what we've asked of him. See, this has been so liberating for me in my life because as a pastor, you feel like responsible for people, you know? And... Um, I, I prayed for people, the Lord to, you know, do great things, and I've seen God do miracles. I've seen families come back together. You know, by the way, I haven't said this. I didn't say this earlier. It's an, I think it's in some of my notes. One of the things that prayer cannot do, prayer can never manipulate another person's will. I have people come to me, and they say, like, man, pray for my wife to come back to me and pray that she'll leave, you know, the affair she's in and all that. And I, I always tell them, I, I'm on a level with you. We're going to pray. We're going to fast. And when we pray and fast and we pray, Holy Spirit will come around your wife and will convict her and make her feel miserable. But at the end of the day, it's her will that will prevail because God will never override another person's will just because you pray something. And that's liberating. That's helpful. But this has helped me in my, in my life because when I come to the Lord with big stuff, 
stuff I want him to do, stuff that's painful. I said, God, take this away from me. I mean, this is, I hate this, Lord. Take this away from me. And I'm praying, I'm asking God to change this situation. And I'm asking the Lord to take me out. It's like, I'm like Paul in 1 Corinthians, or 2 Corinthians 12. Lord, I got this thorn in the flesh. Take it from me. He prayed it three times. And the Lord never took the thorn away. And what did he say to him? My grace is sufficient for you. Lean on me in the situation you're in. Lean on me. Draw near to me. Trust me in every, sit, every day. Every day that you get up and you face that situation, know that the grace of the Lord is with you as you go through this. Sometimes you pray and he takes the thorn away. And if I did a little vote here, how many like when the Lord just takes the thorn away? Just raise your hand right there. Just raise your hand. Wave your hand. Say, Lord, we like that prayer. Sometimes he lets us walk through it, lets us go with that thing. Here's what... Uh, Mother Teresa said, a couple little quotes here, and I'll end with this. Mother Teresa said this, and anything Mother Teresa says, I listen to. Mother Teresa says this, listen to this. Prayer is not asking. Prayer is putting oneself in the hands of God at his disposition and listening to his voice in the depth of our hearts. Prayer is not asking. Prayer is putting oneself in the hands of God at his disposition and listening to his voice in the depths of our heart. Soren Kierkegaard, the famous Danish philosopher and theologian, says this, the function of prayer is not to influence God, but rather to change the nature of the one who prays. John writes this little spiritual community, you know, it was God's will that you're saved. And if you, if you prayed to ask the Lord in your heart, because it's God's will, we know that's God's will. We know that we have from him what we ask, and you are saved. And then he extrapolates the principle about how we function in life by trusting God, trusting God when you, sometimes the Lord opens the sea before you. I thought about Daniel, how sometimes, you know, we pray to, to the Lord not to put us in the lion's den. And sometimes God puts us in the lion's den and he keeps us in the lion's den. He preserves us. And I'm just, I'm about, I need to quit. I'm, almost, I'm out of time, but I want to say this to you today. There's somebody and there's some peoples in this room that you need to know that the perseverance and the grace of God is God is preserving you. God is keeping you. He's with you. You're not out of his will and his divine grace and power is with you. Would you say this with me? Let's quote this verse that we've studied this morning. Let's quote this verse. Say it with me. If we ask anything according to his will he hears us and we know if we ask in his will we have that which you've asked to the lord would you lift your hands to the lord right now you're under his kingdom you're under his rule prayer is lord help me to see help me to tune the station help me to know come to him in honesty but let him adjust your focus because he's the Lord. Father God, we thank you that the power of the Lord is on this church, that you are working in this church. And individually, as people leave and get in their cars today and go to different jobs and different schools tomorrow and go to different places, there is a group of people in this church, this, these wonderful people, that you're working in their life in a sovereign way, that you're changing them, and you're working in power, and that, Lord, you are uh, with them, and they are part of your kingdom. And we thank you for that in the name of Jesus. And everyone said amen and amen and amen. Amen. I love you guys. Let's give the Lord a praise offering this morning. Thank you for coming.